Enough about that. My name is Peter, and I help direct the events here at Strand for a little bit of history as you file in. Uh, the Strand was founded in 1927 by the Bass family, excuse me, over on what was then 4th Avenue's Book Row, stretching from Union Square to Astor Place. Book Row gradually dwindled until after 91 years. Strand is the sole survivor, still run by the Bass family, and still housing new and used books. Tonight, I am very honored and excited to help launch The Farm, the debut novel from Joanne Ramos. Joanne is a former investment banker and private equity investor who went on to write on the staff of The Economist, and she currently serves on the board of The Moth. The Farm arrives fulsomely praised for its timely investigation of race and class in the life of a Filipino immigrant who stakes her future on Golden Oaks, an upstate retreat where she is paid to carry a child to term under total lockdown and total surveillance. And like I said, if you haven't read it, who boy, get ready. Joining her to discuss the book is Tara Clancy, a frequent moth host and a Grand Slam storytelling champ, as well as a writer with bylines in the New York Times, The Nation, the Paris Review Daily, and the New York Times Magazine. She also acted on HBO's Girls and guests on NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Her memoir, The Clancy's of Queens, of which we have a couple copies available over by the door with Colin, if you're interested, is a Barnes & Noble Discover Great New Writers pick. Um, I couldn't be more excited to have such a fantastic crowd here to celebrate this incredible first novel. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Tara, Joanne, and the farm to The Strand. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Oh, watch out now, everybody. Hi. How are you? I'm very excited to be here. My friend Joanne is nervous. But we're going to have a good conversation anyway. Um, right? Yes. OK. Yes. Yes. So just a quick little thing. Um, I know Joanne, as they mentioned uh, in the intro, uh, Joanne sits on the board of the moth. And I love the moth, yes. I'm wearing my moth socks. Um, I'm a storyteller, and, and Joanne is a big fan of storytelling. Um, and so that's how we know each other. We decided this would be fun, since we are already friends and know one another. Um, all right. Let's do it. Okay. okay. So you, I, I am this so, I love this book. It's an amazing book. And in one hand, it's like this page turner of an exciting read. And, and at the same time, there's so much import. Um, and to get those two things together, I think is a little bit rare. But because of that, I think this book is getting an incredible amount of buzz. People are so excited about it. How does that make you feel? So um, it has been a total whirlwind mm. and a dream come true. I've wanted to write a book since I was a kid. Um, and I have a dream agent, a dream editor, a dream team at Random House. But what's funny about writing is that you feel like you express yourself best in the written word. And then when you're selling a book, you're speaking like this in front of people all the time. And part of selling a book is coming up with a story of how you got there. Yeah. And what's funny about that is that as a writer, you also know that every story you tell is a story that you've chosen not to tell. That there are very many ways to tell a story and that stories can be freeing, but they can also be binding because they're one way to connect the dots. And so I think one of the reasons I've been so excited about the book's reception, um, but also nervous about it, is telling the story about how I got here to a room of 200 people who I know in so many different ways um, it's a funny thing, and I think that's why I wrote the book the way I did. I know we haven't yet told you about the book, and I can do that, but I wrote the book with four different narrators because I don't want to write a screed or get on a soapbox. I, want, I wanted to tell the story about this world from many different ways so that people might question the one way that they always want to see things. And so even the process of being nervous about telling my one story to people who know me in a million different ways, I think illuminates how I approach the book as well. Yeah. 
Um, and we are we're gonna put a peg in that because we're gonna get we're gonna get back to that. Both Joanne and I kind of straddle several different worlds, and we we know this sort of feeling of being like you represent one thing and then another thing, and so having this whole room full of people that know you from different sides. We'll talk back again about that and a little bit of what that means for the both of us. Um, but let's do the teaser now so that people know what we're talking about. And you do the, you do the teaser. I mean, okay. I could do the impress, my, I could do the like Tara Clancy cliff notes of the farm, but I feel like you should do it. Okay, so if you, for those of you who haven't read the book, if you imagine the most luxurious retreat you've ever seen, there are private chefs that make organic food their daily massages, uh, private yoga instruction. Everything of it, everything is the best that's on offer and it's all for free for the women who live there. In fact, these women get paid big money to spend nine months there. And the only catch is that every move is monitored and they're totally cut off from their lives back home because they have agreed contractually to that their, their main job, their overriding priority, is the life that's growing inside of them. Because all these women are surrogates for some of the richest people in the world. And so this is the farm, this is Golden Oaks. Um, in my book, there is a young Filipina woman named Jane, who is a single mother without very many options, who wants to give her daughter, a baby daughter, a better life. Uh, and she's not sure how to do that until she hears about this place. And so she signs on for it. And what she realizes, it's not as easy as she thought. Um, because being apart from her daughter, um, when she starts to get hints that not all may be well in Queens where she left her, um, really makes her come face to face with the reality that she gave up all agency, all choice for those nine months. And the question is what she's going to do about it. And in the book, I have three other characters, the woman who runs the farm, um, a white young privileged woman who's another host at the farm, and, um, Who's the other? Oh, Ate, the a baby yeah. nurse, an older baby nurse who's, who's sort of the heart of the book in many ways. Uh, and what I hope that people get out of the book, which is not any sort of real takeaway, but it's just thinking, one, that this could happen. I, I would be surprised and hope that no one reads it and thinks this could never happen. And also that there are many ways to look at the story and that any one of those four narrators could have, you could have built a story around her. Oh yeah, this could happen. And I, I, I was just telling somebody today that I was like, you know, if we think like, if The Handmaid's Tale is like maybe 50 years away, mm -hmm. the farm is like five years away. Right. Like, and you will find yourself reading this book no matter what pack on you and, and going, would I do it? You know, would, would I do it? Would, would I, I mean like, I, even me, even my butch lesbian self <laughs> read The Farm and I kept being like, how much? <laughs> How much? Um. <laughs> and it is happening. I mean, the, um, the genesis for the book, I, I'd, I'd wanted to, to write about these themes for a long time. It just took me a year and a half of writing every day, every day, not being able to find a, find a way in. But um, a year and a half into daily writing in the dark, um, I came across this journal in the Wall Street, Wall Street Journal article that yes. I told you about. It was a very short article, and it was about a surrogacy facility in India. And that started the what ifs that led to the creation of the farm. Yeah. And so out there in Thailand, in, in, I've heard recently in Russia, there are these facilities. What I did though is I made it luxury. Yeah. And I just push everything forward just a little bit. And, and, and the hope is that no one can dismiss it as too sci-fi or too out there. And in doing that, if you feel uncomfortable reading the book, which there's a, a lot of readers have told yeah. me they do, I guess the question is why? Because everything in the book, except for maybe one invention I made about these, a stereo system to pump Mozart and a lot of things to your baby in the mm -hmm. tummy so they can get an edge in utero, everything else is already happening. Yeah. And so if you feel uncomfortable, like, why is that? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, all right. I think it's, it's a, maybe it's a good time to go. I think we had a preliminary lunch the other day and we were talking about a few things and we were talking about um, imposter syndrome. And we were talking a little bit about, you know, straddling these different worlds and what it's like, you know, I can show up and people hear my voice and they think, great, that's a dental hygienist, right? <laughs> they don't think that's a person with bylines in the New York Times or the Paris Review and, and an author. Um, and, but I've been sort of both things. I am in many ways both things. And so for you, at the heart of this book is the experience of a an immigrant, which 
you can speak to that. And then there is uh, the experience of people who hire nannies, and you can speak to that as well. Um, what has that, if you are willing to share with us a little bit of what that, you know, feeling like you're straddling worlds, you know, how has that been for you? Yeah, I think that's um, probably the primary, I don't know if it's a primary, but it, but it is a theme in my life. It is something that as I think about it, I've always felt that I've straddled worlds, whether as a Filipina immigrant to Wisconsin, as a financial aid kid at Princeton, as one of the few women on Wall Street and the only woman at the private equity firm where I worked for a while. And then as a mother in New York who um, has a lot of friends and myself has hired amazing women to help me raise my kids. Uh, and this, what's funny about always feeling like an outsider is it gives you some distance. Uh, and so you're able to see that life is a lot more complex than we like to make it. Uh, and and I did, and that is again why I didn't want to write villains or saints in this book. Why I really tried to make all the characters complicated that way. Um, and I just say that because I've I've met readers when I've met readers who love the book. They love it because they are open or like the, that grayness. Um, when I've met readers who are less comfortable with the book, they've said, "Ramos, what are you trying to say? What's your stand on this?" And that was never my point. It was never meant to be. A screed. It was a, it's a continuation of a conversation I've had with myself my whole life. Not just about what it means to only see people in buckets and want to paint people a certain way so simplistically, when it's just more complicated than that, but also, um, which you and I have talked about too, this whole notion of an American meritocracy. Um, and that I've been told so many times in my life that I'm the embodiment of the American dream. And it's yes and no, right? Like what. I lucked out in so many ways that my parents were educated, that my mom figured out the public school system in Racine, Wisconsin, so that Joyce and I got bused to a great gifted school across town. We worked hard, but there's a lot more to it than that. And as I've grown older, especially starting with Princeton, quite honestly, and then also just coming to New York and meeting women who work, and I'm talking about the women who um, have helped me raise my kids, and also, um, who I've befriended, who are um, nannying, uh, who work as hard as anyone I know. And what separates my opportunities from theirs and my kids' opportunities from theirs has as much to do with happenstance than it does with any kind of merit. And if we believe that at all, then I think we have to question a whole lot more. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Um, I don't know if I was curious to find out a little more about your family background, if there's some stuff you want to share. But I know you were born in Manila. Yes. Um, so we were, uh, I was born in Manila. Uh, we moved to Wisconsin when I was six. And it was a funny sort of dual existence there in the sense that uh, during the weeks, uh, there weren't that many Asians in, in our actual town. So my sister, my little sister, Joyce, who's here, and I were two of the four Asians in our big public elementary school. <laughs> Uh, the other two were these brothers. I think they were Korean, but they never told me. But everyone always thought we were part of the same family. They're like, oh, it was a big family. I'm like, oh, God. Really? So it's kind of like you wanted to get near the boys for safety, but also like, no, we're not, we're not brother or sister. Um, but then on the weekends, we would visit my dad's family in a town about 30 minutes away, and they were part of a really tight Filipino community there. Uh, and so it was those long Sundays after church visiting my dad's family and my aunties and uncles that I really, we really got a sense of what it means to be family. Mm. Uh, and so from that sort of straddling, I moved on to Princeton and I loved Princeton in many ways. It opened many doors for me, but it really was jarring not coming from the East Coast. Um, it was the first place that I met kids who had never worked and probably never would work and, and took it as a given. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the first place that I learned that summer was a verb, and now I go to Fire <laughs> Island. But like yeah. at the time when this person asked me at this yeah, party in an this. eating yes. club, yeah, this is good. Listen to this. Go. I had just said I was from Wisconsin, which already makes people's eyes glaze over if they're from either coast. But then um, they said, "Where do you summer?" And I said, "Well, I'm from Wisconsin because I just told you I'm from Wisconsin." I didn't know what they were saying uh, because in Wisconsin, at least how we grew up, you spend every season there like right. you spring there and you right. winter there and you summer there and you <laughs> fall there um and and that was the beginning that was the yeah. beginning being like whoa i've worked really hard and everyone works hard and if you work hard you're gonna get to the place you're supposed to go and princeton was the first place that i met people 
who were from all kinds of places and huge disparities that just made me start questioning that. And then from there I got into banking and a whole different world and started raising my kids with my wonderful husband in New York. And with each step along that path, it just, just became clearer that there is so much luck involved. And the whole time I'd wanted to write this book, it just didn't seem like a practical thing until I was older. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so even still, right, like I, I, I hope you don't mind me doing this to you, but I, I think this is really telling because I mean, I outed myself. I said, people always think I'm a dental hygienist, right? But you, you go to Princeton, you go into banking, you, you know, sort of straddle, like move over into this other social strata. And yet when you pick up your children from school, you've told me people have thought you were their nanny. It was only with Annabelle because Annabelle, people feel like looks Indian. And so there were, with Annabelle, when I would wheel her around, people I was like, oh my gosh, is her mom Indian? I'm like, no, she's, that's, that's <laughs> um, But with my other boys, uh, my, my boys, they seemed to accept that I was their mom or they just weren't curious about it. But yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's funny. It, it's a, it was a funny, it's a funny thing. And, it, and it's not like I cared in one sense. I just thought they made a mistake. And in other sense, I'm like, what kind of assumptions are you making that, yeah, I don't know. Absolutely, yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, those are those mine are you know classist and and racist assumptions. You know that just because you look the way you look and I sound the way that I sound, you know um, <laughs> that that's what we are. Um, all right, so I wanted to okay, so we can we can come back to our like straddling world imposter syndrome thing, but I also wanted to talk about what it, on the fun side you know, what it feels like for you to have achieved this dream, right? Because we've, you've, you've gone through several different careers and this is, this is all new. This was, this was, I don't know, did you see this chapter coming? I'd always want, I've, I mean, I've, I've been writing my whole life. I just didn't write fiction for a long time. Yeah. Um, when my husband and I were just friends before we were dating, I would send Aww. him these 2,000 word emails. He would write, because we were both in finance at the time, He'd be like, hey, what's up? I'm like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like And then he's like, I can't reply. He's like, you, you fight, type so fast and they're so long. But it was, I think, my way of writing and doing something I love because it yeah. wasn't really for me finance. It wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, you know, it wasn't until, it was a very cliche thing. I turned 40 and I was like, what am I gonna do? What do I really wanna do? My, my youngest child, Henry, was finally in school full day and I had time and I realized I didn't wanna go back to The Economist uh, where I'd written, I wanted to write this book that I'd always wanted to write. And it just, the hardest part of that was saying I'm gonna do it. And then just going Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, just writing and writing until the idea came. Yeah. Um, and I, just one thing which is related but not Exactly. I just wanted to say is that when, when I've been thinking a lot about why I didn't major in English or mm -hmm. take a bunch of creative writing classes or if it is true that this is my childhood dream, why didn't I do any of that? And, it, and, in, and, I, and I did take one class at Princeton. I got into this writing workshop uh, by this great writer, Russell Banks. And um, what I didn't know because I'd never been in a workshop is that you also get critiqued too. I thought you would just learn how to write. Uh, yes, yes. And so... Mm -hmm. um, Yes, that was very intimidating. Yeah. And so I didn't volunteer to go first or second or third because I, I was scared to have to share work with, with people. And, and as the weeks passed, I got more intimidated because I remember one of the girls went to one of the field schools in New York. I didn't know what that meant, mm -hmm. but, I, but that made me nervous. And someone else went to a boarding school. I, I just felt really overwhelmed by it. And I had my critique. And looking back as a 46-year-old woman, it probably wasn't a bad critique. But as a 19-year-old, um, I just felt it was too much. I did not feel that I belonged to that table. And so I dropped out. And that was the last time I wrote fiction, which wow. is crazy. And I don't think it was a dramatic decision like I'm done. I'm never yeah. writing again. It just, I just went, got practical and I got a job and, and, I, and it took me in a different way. Um, and one of the great things about having the book received the way it is, is that I've had the chance to be, I've never told that story until I started speaking about the book. Mm. And I've been able to talk about it in rooms with young women who, and well, it was mostly young women students who hopefully don't have to feel that way and feel that wherever they are, they always belong. And I say this in particular, I'm sorry to shout it out to uh, Pauline and Lily. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
yeah, I think I could I can absolutely relate to that feeling of like this isn't or I don't know if you have this experience, but this isn't a thing to do. Right. You know, I don't know. Yes. Did your did your family ever sort of like being a writer wasn't a thing to no, do? You know, what's so amazing about my family is they never told me that they didn't tell you that. And no, I, I think I just absorbed it. Like I want to make okay. I wanted to be able to support them. I wanted to be practical. I wanted to not worry. I don't know. Can I you say what it. your what your parents did for work? So my dad worked at this company called SC Johnson, which is a, they started as a wax company and he was a sales manager for it. And then my mom stayed at home until she went back to work auditing yeah. a bank. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I've totally lost my train of thought. That's okay. That's what they're. Um, I, I know. <laughs> well, I, well, I was just talking about how, like, just the idea. You were saying when you got to Princeton, you, you know, the idea of being a writer was. I, I feel like, and I, for me, it's a, it's because of my class background. I don't know for you uh, if it's the same, but it was like that's not a thing that you can do. Like my, my family was like, get a city job with a pension. What are you nuts? You know, you can write your little stories on the side, but like pay your rent, you know? Yeah, I don't, it never really occurred to me that it never, I, they never told me that. I just yeah. never thought that I, I, when I took, when I applied to that creative writing class, it's because I wanted to try to learn to be a better writer. Yeah. But I never thought that I would be able to do it right away. I, I really wanted the best job I could get because I was mm. very much an overachiever. And the best job at the time was to go on Wall Street or consulting. And so that's what I did in the sense of, the world I was in at that time. And uh, so it never occurred to me. And in fact, when I did finally make the break with finance to try to write, my husband found this email and read it aloud at my 45th birthday last year, which was really moving to me. He found the email from my dad, who has since passed away, when I said, Daddy, I want, I'm going to, I'm quitting finance in this assured path, and I'm going to try to write financial journalism. But still, like, it was still <laughs> a big break. And he was only supportive. Oh, only supportive. Great. So they never made me feel that way. That was me. It was me absorbing it. That's great. Yeah. So that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Back to a little bit of inspiration, because I feel like we kind of like script over it a little quickly. So there was I mean, you talked a lot to me about the the article that you read uh, about the women in India. Mm -hmm. um, what also about your experience with nannies here in in New York? I think I feel like there was a couple of stories that you told me that I think people would want to hear. Yeah, I think it was more um, in getting to know, befriending people who are often mothers who take care of other people's kids, sometimes leaving their own children halfway around the world to do so. Um, it, it, it made me think a lot about, as I've said, the myth, the reality and myth of meritocracy, and also how we fail to see the people around us all the time. In mm -hmm. fact, since the book has come out a day ago, I've had a couple people come up to me and say, I've been reading your book and I thought back to when I had somebody helping my kids and I wonder if I saw her or treated her that way. And I, um, and I think it goes the other way. I think that we can also see people of privilege in very black and white and very flattened terms that, mm -hmm. it, that I think is equally unfair. Uh, when I started writing the book, I joined a writing workshop in Brooklyn because I had, hadn't written in fiction in 20 years. And I remember my, one of the characters in the book is this woman, May Yu, who runs Golden Oaks. And so she's very ambitious, wealthy, and people hated her and they wanted to hate her. And even when I would make her kind of nice in the stories I submitted, mm -hmm. people were like, she's evil, she's the worst. I'm like, no, I mean, in some way, I, I, in some ways, there are parts of me that are May Yu, right? I, and, and it's, I think, a reaction to that in a lot of ways that mm -hmm. the, the book is meant to dispel th this idea that if you're on one or, or other side of these divides, you've got to paint people in this very simplistic, flat way. Yeah. Um, in a way that we can't even speak to each other or see each other. Yeah. And but it's interesting because people are often like surprised at my background that I've like kind of jumped in and out of things. And, and we expect that everyone has this like one this one experience only. And then meanwhile, that's the, the opposite is true. You know, so many people have so many different uh, experiences. And I, I, I love that about the book. I think nobody could have written this book but you you know you were able to get every angle in there um and it, and it's it's just great um before i take any questions from anybody that they may have in the audience is there anything else that you want people to know about this book not really i just thank you so much for being here and for supporting me and for um telling your friends so many of you've told your own friends about the book to 
to spread the word and I really appreciate it. This is my, honestly, this is something I've wanted to do for, so, for decades and decades of my life and that it's happening is uh, overwhelming to me and I really appreciate it. Yay. Yay. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're going to do some questions. We're just at such a nice packed house tonight. I see everybody standing up in the back, so I feel like we shouldn't... I mean, Joanne and I could talk and talk and talk, but you're standing in the back there. So if there are questions, uh, now I think is a good time for us to do some questions. We have uh, several minutes for that. Um, and in lieu of passing the mic, if I will just repeat your question to the group. If anyone has a question for Joanne. Yes. Is there a specific reason why you called it the farm? So the, um, this is one of those intuitive things because I just used it when I was starting to save the book. I just saved it as the farm and I put the date. That's how it, <laughs> but, but in the book, it's because the, the uh, hosts in the book, some of them call Golden Oaks the farm. And it tends to be the hosts who have the ability to walk away, who could use the money but don't really need the money. And when you see a shift in the main character, the young Filipina mother who starts to say things like the farm, it's because there's been some sort of shift with her too. The other thing is it is like a baby farm and it's um, part of the marketing shtick of the woman who runs it in the sense that she's trying to sell a wholesome, organic experience for your precious baby that you should pay them millions of dollars for. So yeah. And there's goats or so, goats? No, alpacas. There's alpaca there alpacas. Too. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. alpacas, yes. That's a good question yeah. that I haven't thought about. Um, I, you know, I don't know that I came to any answers, but I do think that in delving into, let's say, Reagan, the young white woman who is quite a lost soul, um, I was very lost in my 20s and as a teen, I was a seeker the way she is. And it just made me remember that and think through a little bit more about how much of that was my ability to be lost because even though I had to work, I also was at a wonderful school that was going to give me opportunity. So it made me question things like that. With Mayu and Reagan, they had a lot of conversations. Mayu runs the farm, Reagan is one of the hosts about free trade and is it fair? And, and if two willing parties make a trade under economics, that means it's fair. But what if one party doesn't have a lot of choices? Those are conversations I had with my dad all the time growing up, but it made me rethink it as an adult and see where I stood. And as a kid, it was very black and white that my dad was a rightist Reaganite wrong. And as an adult, knowing a bit more, it's complicated. I mean, I don't think anyone knows how to make a just system, right? So, so because you're one on one end or the other doesn't mean you're evil. It means that we haven't figured it out yet and we're not talking enough. Was that a dodge? <laughs> a little, that's all right. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Do you have a sense of themes that you looked at in this book that you might want to carry on to your next book? The, there is not, so I've, I thought about this in the sense of, I was like, God, I love the character of Ate and what is her pre-story and all this kind of stuff. I think this is, my career is so late in coming and so exciting to me that I do want to do something different with the next one. And what I'm already thinking about has some of the same themes, especially in terms of race and, 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 and some, of the, some of the aspects of the book. Um, yeah, I was about to get more into that, but I think I won't because I don't want to tell you anyone. I, I'm not yet ready to talk about my second work. Yeah. Okay, yes, hi. Hi, I'm curious with three kids and presumably a very busy life, if you could describe what your writing process was like, like what your, how you structured the whole process of you know, giving birth to this book. So, so when I 
committed to writing the book. It still took a while to really commit to writing the book because it's hard. Now it's easy because I write every day. But back then, the idea of sitting down and writing every day when you have always other obligations encroaching was hard. I read a, an article, and it doesn't matter the number, but it was something like 33 days to make a new habit or 67 or 22. It was some number, and I just took it as gospel. And I made myself sit down for that number of days and write every morning. And it actually worked in the sense that I didn't get a book out of it because I had no idea still, but I, uh, meaning I hadn't come up with the idea of the farm yet, but it, but it did create the habit. And from there, it was mostly persistence and faith. I mean, I really have wanted to do this for so long. And the worst that was going to happen is that it didn't pan out. But I, when I started writing it, really, it took a year and a half of writing very, very bad short stories about dog walkers to the rich or an Amazon fulfillment center with people packaging up expensive cashmere. So I don't know. It was so bad. Like the stuff I was doing for a year and a half until I came upon the Wall Street Journal article. Um, but the, the first step and the biggest step was to say, I'm going to do it, even if it ends up being a book of crappy short stories. And writing every day when the kids were at school. Hi. So would you, Joanne, go to the farm? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I actually would read the ads in the Princeton newspaper about selling eggs, thinking like, nice to have some cash. But what's funny is at that time, and maybe still now, all the ads were for people who looked nothing like me. They were always like five, six and above, blonde, blue eyed, mm -hmm. athletic. I'm like, I'm not athletic. Like none, none of it fit. And so I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. But look, if you're, if I wanted, maybe I'd want to start writing a book earlier in my twenties and you go and you make half a million dollars or whatever it is. And I can write my book earlier instead of waiting to be 46. I don't know. I don't know, but it's been interesting. We've did the, we've done those surveys both here in the U.S. and in the U.K. and and a lot of a lot of the younger women would. Yeah, the age part of it is a big deal. When mm -hmm. I thought about it, right? Um, besides my butchiness, I was like, I have two children. You know, would I would I have done this at twenty one? Right. Yes. Would I do this now and leave right. my right. kids? Right. You know, and have and right. not be able to see my children? Like, wow, that's a different. That's a different ball game, you know? Sort of to that point, I have to say people are saying it's so extreme that these women have to leave their kids and then go to the farm and be cut off. But if you think about it, there's so many men and women who make that choice every day, whether they're leaving their kids in Pakistan or the Philippines, or they're here working two jobs because you can't subsist on a living wage in America, there are people sacrificing family for family all the time. Mm -hmm. And so again, it's the book is what is happening, just pushed more. And yeah, that was my question. absolutely. Um, all right. Uh, anybody else with a question on this side of the room? I saw. Yes. Hi. This might go to your kids. Ooh. Oh. Wow, guys. <laughs> the whole process of your mom writing. Like, did you even notice that you was writing? Did you even notice? <laughs> <laughs> I um, used to print out my stories, especially when I was at this writing workshop, but even in general, and I don't like to waste paper, so I would put it in our bin where we, the kids doodle on scrap paper. And then one day, Annabelle comes up to me and she's like, Mommy, may you said the F word. And I'm like, what, are you reading my book? And then I started getting rid of it. So I think she, she knew. So they kind of knew. They were sneaking it, or she was sneaking it. <laughs> Oh, that's pretty cute. My kids thought that I hand wrote the whole thing because my son was like five, so he couldn't conceive of like typing. He's like, who's typing it for you? <laughs> I'm, I'm typing it. I'm not, it's not in crayon. Um, anybody else with a question? Are we good? What do you think, Joanne? Do you feel like, are you ready to, uh, to do some signing? I am. I'm ready. You're, Thank you're you ready guys for so some much for signing? Coming. All right. Now you sign book. <laughs> hello, hello. Thank 
you guys so much. Thank you, Joanne, and thank you, Tara, for being with us, and thank all of you, each and every one of you, each and every of the 200 of you.